This is the lecture for People of Promise, Divided Kingdom, <clears throat> uh, lesson number 22. Um, before we get started, though, just a couple of quick uh, comments. I wanna, first of all, I want to thank Luke Chow for giving the lecture last week. Um, it was very timely that uh, he, had, uh, he had that responsibility. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, I had a, a little accident this uh, last Sunday. Uh, while I was exercising, I passed out at the gymnasium and um, and fell and uh, resulted in a uh, broken rib. But uh, probably more seriously is what my doctors think I suffer from syncopathy, which is this um, which is this um, malady where you faint at various times, and so. I would appreciate your prayers, uh, obviously concerning <clears throat> recovery from from a broken rib, which is uncomfortable and at times painful. But uh, but but more and more uh, more importantly, understanding the root cause behind this um, this syncopathy. Anyway, with that, uh, let's uh, let's pray over our lesson as we look at God's purposes for our suffering. <clears throat> let's. Uh, Let's pray. Father in heaven, <clears throat> um, uh, it causes us to wonder. Many times as we look at this world, we see the suffering, whether it be in our personal lives or in the people and the places around us. And um, at times we question your goodness. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would, um, as we open up your scriptures here in this lesson, that we would see that... Uh, that you truly are a good and gracious and all powerful God, and that you have great and important purposes behind the pain and the disappointments that we experience. We pray, Lord, that we, you would open up our eyes to what you are doing in our lives in these ways. We, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, this week uh, we're taking a bit of a, a change, slight change in direction from our normal study of, uh, you know, focusing on a particular passage. We've been jumping around in various, um, various verses. In light of Judah's rebellion and subsequent exile at the hands of the Babylonians, we were engaged to this week in this topical study of suffering. The BSF staff, through this lesson, is helping us to address God's purposes behind our sufferings and disappointments. Unbelievers question God's goodness and power. They reason God cannot possibly be good and allow much of the suffering we see in this world. And then if he is good, then he certainly cannot be all powerful as the Bible suggests. He cannot, they reason, since he cannot prevent suffering. But the Bible teaches us that God is righteous. He is good and he is all powerful. So we must understand how pain and suffering are consistent with his character and his plan. Let me start off by stating several biblical, biblical truths uh, on which we are going to build this lesson. First of all, God does love us. He loves his people. And then secondly, God is able to protect and provide for us in every way. A third truth, God's purpose for us is to show forth his character in our lives. Our purpose then is to glorify him. And then finally, there is no question that bad things, crushing things, disappointing things happen to all of us. They are present in our lives. So we come to now to this grand question. Why does God allow suffering in our lives uh, if his purpose is to love and care for us? Paul wrote in Romans chapter 80, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? So the question, how can we reconcile our suffering with Paul's claim here from Romans 8. The answer will be found by looking at suffering, not from our perspective, but from God's perspective. 
He acts only in ways that are consistent with his character, which is loving toward us. While the Bible speaks of God's anger towards us, this concept must be defined properly. God's anger or wrath is his necessary response to the injustices of this world. To understand suffering, then we must get God right. We must understand his character correctly. Dr. T David Talley says, God is nothing less than what he has revealed about himself in the Bible. And he is always more. He is always who he is, and he is never who he is not. When the scriptures tell us that God always acts for his glory and our good, we must embrace that truth. The purpose for this lesson then is that we will all come to trust God to accomplish his purposes, his purposes through our earthly pains. Now, I've my outline is very sim very simple one, two parts to it. First of all, we're going to look at God's purposes in our suffering. That will be the why behind our suffering. And then we're going to look at God's promises in our suffering. That will be the how of our suffering. The how we persevere or even triumph in our suffering or through our suffering. Now, to refresh our memories a little bit, we spent much of the, we've spent much of this study following the divided peoples of Israel. That's the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The Lord had chosen these people to bless and to, in turn, bless uh, the world. They were called to be a holy people, a royal priesthood. But given that great privilege and responsibility, they chose instead to follow after their pagan neighbors. God, through Moses, had entered into a covenant with these people. In full disclosure, Moses laid out what would happen to them if they met their covenant responsibilities and what would happen to them if they failed to live up to their side of the deal. Prosperity and peace would come from obedience, troubles and torment from disobedience. And what we have seen through these many weeks is that Israel made the, the irrational choice of sin over and over again. The Lord displayed his long-suffering nature for hundreds of years until he finally chose to send these people into exile. First, it was the northern kingdom conquered and scattered by the Assyrians and later Judah taken into exile by the Babylonians. All of this done as an expression of God's anger. 2 Kings 24, all of this was done because of the Lord's anger. He thrust them from his presence. Strong words, and yet we cannot discount the real pain and suffering that occurred as these two nations fell. People, experienced the dread and starvation of being under siege. Cities destroyed, sons killed before their parents' eyes, the survivors carried away to distant lands. And these consequences fell to both the godly and the ungodly. You need only to turn to the book of Daniel to learn about men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and also Daniel himself. All godly men swept up by the consequences of the nation's sin. We see similar tragedy today, uh, all of which generates questions in our minds. What is God doing in this world? Why does he allow so much pain here? Isn't there a better way? We'll try to answer some of these questions during our lesson. But maybe if we start at the beginning, we can make some sense of suffering. According to the scriptures, the root cause of suffering is sin. Humanity fell into sin with Adam and Eve. Genesis 3 records how Adam and Eve questioned God's goodness and sinned against him. Their sin brought a devastating consequences on not only humanity, but all of creation. 
In Genesis 3, not, verses 9 through 18, God spelled out some of the consequences of their first sin. Childbirth would be painful for women. The land would be cursed for men. The soil would yield its fruit only after painful toil. Paul in Romans 5 helps us better understand how sin corrupted every one of us. Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Death came to all people. That's spiritual and physical death. An internal change impacting every one of us. The perfect Eden gave way to a wor the world in which we live today, where suffering is commonplace. In a general sense, all suffering has its root in the tragic fall of humanity. To be clear, not all suffering is directly tied to specific personal sins, but our sinful state does explain the general cause of all human suffering. It's the result of living in a fallen world. Now back to the Israelites. They had been called to live as God's covenant people, called and privileged by God to have a unique place among all the people on earth. They were chosen to represent him to the world, but they refused to live as he intended. They rejected God and failed repeatedly to respond in repentance. So finally, God's judgment came as he promised. 2 Kings 21 Verses 12 to 15 says, says this, Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am going to bring such a disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. I will stretch out over Jerusalem, that's the southern kingdom, the measuring line used against Samaria, the northern kingdom, the plumb line used against the house of Ahab. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of their enemies. God's harsh judgment fell upon his people through the exile. Northern Israel had previously been taken to Assyria, Judah, now attacked and removed to Babylon. And the destruction of these attacks uh, are difficult to fully appreciate. In the midst of that destruction, though, Isaiah 48 offers hope. God was purifying his people. Isaiah wrote, See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. Think about this. God designed this judgment and allowed his own people to suffer intensely, ultimately for their good and his glory. How do we see God's purposes in such a brutal story? How was his heart toward his wayward people shown? What was that? Because God is who he is, we can absolutely trust his purposes and actions. Everything he is and does ultimately brings his glory and upholds his purposes. God is glorified in that his various attributes are displayed in our lives. He purp he purposes, his purposes are fulfilled in that his covenant promises are ultimately fulfilled, whether it be by judgment or blessing. So far, we have talked about suffering as a general result of sin, but specific, that is, specific disobedience to God's law. But there are other reasons for suffering. Job is an example. He suffered to show his faith and devotion to the Lord. Unbeknownst to him, he was used as a test between Satan and the Lord. He suffered physical, material, emotional loss, all to test his faith is suffering an example to us all. Another reason for suffering is seen in Jesus' healing of the man born blind. John 9, 
Jesus' disciples asked him why the man was born blind. Was it due to his sins prior to birth or was it due to his parents' sins? Jesus said neither. The man was born blind and lived in that state his entire life until Jesus came and rest restored his sight for the very purpose of glorifying God. These examples should serve as cautionary tales that we should never assign a reason to someone's suffering. We will likely never know the mind of God on a particular situation, especially in another person's life. I think of Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. These three friends heard of Job's plight and they came to provide comfort to him. They came and stayed with him. They showed great empathy toward him. But in the end, they could not keep their mouths shut. They were convinced that Job had done wrong and God was punishing him. They continued to, observe, uh, to urge him to confess his sins and repent. In the end, these three men were rebuked by the Lord. Job 42, God said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me. Only God can know his reasons for what he causes or allows. Our limited understanding cannot rightly explain what God intends in any given situation. God's thoughts and ways are higher and different than ours. Assuming people's sin or God's correction in a particular situation will ultimately prove hurtful to people all already struggling through a tough situation. The best response is to examine our own hearts and ask what God is teaching us and to seek to provide his comfort. God would would have been fully justified and glorified had he destroyed Judah, but he didn't. Out of the stump ultimately came the shoot of Jesse, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, God's, uh, God's uh, redemptive plan includes suffering. The suffering of the one brought deliverance for the many. The suffering servant that we learned about in the last two weeks, that is Jesus Christ, embraced suffering and obedience and ultimately was raised to the place of exaltation. Through suffering, God is glorified. There's another reason that God allows suffering in our lives, and that is to teach us that this place is not our final home. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the, the, the tent, that is our bodies, uh, that, that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Suffering weans us off the things of this world. The struggles with sin, the aches and pains of our bodies, the prevalence of wickedness, the dysfunctional nature of our societies. All of these things help us to realize that our only hope is in the Lord and in his new creation. And so the principle for this first part is that the Lord directs our suffering for his purposes. As I mentioned previously, suffering is a normal part of life. We enter life through the pain of childbirth. You can't get more stressful than that. And we will experience pain and suffering throughout our lives. And at some level, we do recognize that pain provides benefits to us. For instance, in the world of sports, athletes undergo the pain and stress of workouts. They develop and harden their bodies. They do so, so they can ultimately accomplish their goals. As believers, we recognize God's purposes in developing our characters, molding us into the image of Christ. It is the work of sanctification. As Paul stated in Romans 5, God intends suffering 
in our lives to produce perseverance because perseverance develops character and godly character leads to hope. I think of how God used suffering to draw me to Christ initially and then has done so periodically throughout my life. Today, I'm suffering from the pain of this broken rib and the uncertainty of psychopathy. What God has in mind, I, don't, I do not know. I only know he does have purposes for, for me. My question then is, how have you seen God's purposes accomplished through your suffering? He may allow some suffering as he did with Job. For others, he causes it directly. In all suffering, he directs it for his purposes. Now, two weeks ago, I shared a bit of trivia that I had learned from Dr. John Hanna, and that was that there were 365 places in the scriptures where we are encouraged not to fear. One of those verses uh, was part of our lesson this week. But rather than read it to you, uh, Isaiah 41.10 from my Bible, I want to read it from one of the stanzas of the hymn, How Firm a Foundation, one of my favorite hymns. And that stanza goes, Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. We have a God who does not shield us from suffering and pain. Rather, we have a God who enters into our suffering with us. So the first promise from God is that he will accompany us through our suffering. That is how he can provide us with great comfort. A second promise is something of a threat, though, from Numbers 32. Moses was encouraging the Israelites before they entered into the promised land. He encouraged them to keep God's law. And then he said, but if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. In other words, the consequences of our sins will come back on us. A loving God can do no less. How can he let us get away with sin? It's an offense against him and a detriment to our lives into our characters. So God promises that our sins will find us out. Another promise uh, is that God uses our trials and tribulations to develop our character. Again, the, the hymn, How Firm a Foundation, says it well. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The, the flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and, they, and thy gold to refine. The hymn pictures the refining of metal. There's the famous uh, description of a silversmith who heats the silver alloy up and then the dross or the impurities uh, float up to the surface, to the top where they are drawn off. The silversmith knows he is finished when he looks into the molten crucible and can see his image in the mirrored surface. God uses our trials to refine us into the image of Jesus Christ. It's the process of sanctification. Peter says it well in his first epistle. He writes, in all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that pr the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And so God's, God's promise here is that he is using our suffering to refine our character. A related promise is found in Romans 8.28 where Paul writes, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This verse relates to God's purposes, which we covered earlier, but suffering for a purpose is in itself a promise. 
For those outside of God's will, these words ring hollow. But for those of us belonging to him, our plight is purposeful. What a precious truth. Following on from verse 28, Paul writes, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. God is not interested in our happiness. He's interested in our holiness. So knowing his intent can help us persevere in suffering. Another promise is that God uses our suffering to ultimately bless other people. Not only does suffering develop our characters, but it provides us with experiences and skills that we might not otherwise obtain. The patriarch Joseph was able to look back on years of slavery and prison and tell his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, for the salvation of many. Paul references the same promise in 2 Corinthians 1, where he praises the God of compassion for his comfort in our troubles. Having experienced his comfort, we then can share that comfort with our brethren who are also suffering. So suffering equips us for service to God and to others. Another promise concerns God's availability in our suffering. He does not give up on us. We suffer the sin of self-sufficiency. We refuse and refuse God's help until we are pushed to the brink. Psalm 118, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Psalm 46 says, He is my ever-present help in trouble. It is great when we see God's patience exceeds our stubbornness. God's ways are not our ways. We think he should shield us from pain and suffering. Not only does he not do that, he sent his son to shoulder the burden of our sins on himself. He suffered the greatest pain and humiliation, that which we deserved for rebelling against him. We serve a God who has entered into this world and experienced suffering for himself. Therefore, he is sympathetic to our plight. So, with all of these promises, let me give you a final principle. And that is that because God alone is sufficient in meeting our needs in suffering, He alone provides hope. As I've just laid out for you, this does not mean that the Lord will eliminate our suffering. It means these promises will be adequate to lead us through our trials. I think of Paul's thorn in the flesh. He prayed earnestly that God would remove it. He did not. But rather, God promised his grace was sufficient for Paul to persevere in his suffering. It's no wonder that God allows or even causes suffering. Some of the greatest testimonies that we have are from godly men and women who have borne up under great suffering, even triumphed. I think of men like Orland Silva and Jim Hildebrand, men who served in our BSF class, both men stricken from cancer, both served joyously until they no longer could physically do so. They knew no better place to be in their final months of life than serving God and his people. They knew their troubles were light and momentary compared to the eternal glory awaiting them. What testimonies they had. Earlier, I posed several questions to, to you. What is God doing through the suffering in this world? And why does he allow so much pain? Isn't, can't there be a better way? Well, my conclusion, after going through all of this, this lesson is, my conclusion is no, there is no better way. This, the, the way this world is playing itself out is the only way in which God can be fully glorified. Dr. Talley says we need to begin with God. He, is all, he should always be our starting point, but he is also our conclusion. We cannot 
make it on our own. We need a Savior. And our suffering proves that truth every day that we live. My question then is, how have you experienced God's sufficiency through past suffering? And have you thanked him for it? And for those of you, or those of us who are currently suffering, he wants us to bring our cares to him. How will you and how will I cast our anxieties on God? Because he cares for us. Trusting God means trusting God with every aspect of our lives, especially the pain and the disappointments. These things happen because he cares for us, not because he doesn't. And with that, let's pray. Father in heaven, um, <clears throat> it truly is amazing that uh, you have created a world where uh, suffering is... Uh, is not only necessary, but desirable for developing us into the very people that you want us to be. We thank you for your purposes. We thank you for your provisions and your promises that help us to persevere and even triumph in our suffering. And we pray, Lord, that as we do so, we pray that we would glorify you and point others to your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray, amen.